Hey everyone, welcome back to One Book, One Story, our Sunday school class here at Northmont. Today we're going to be looking at Obadiah. Um, Obadiah is a minor prophet, and it's one that we don't read terribly often, but I think it has some important truths for us, and I'm looking forward to sharing it with you today. So as you flip to Obadiah and you get prepared, uh, let's uh, just give ourselves a little bit of a, a second to figure out who this person is and why they're speaking to us. Um, Obadiah is uh, a not terribly known prophet. If you um, look throughout scripture, you'll see that name, Obadiah, pop up at different times, but uh, it's a relatively common name in scripture, and so there's a few different ones. You may also remember that, um, I don't know, at least a year ago, I did a, a, a whole sermon just on Obadiah, and so a lot of what you'll be hearing today has uh, a lot of the same kind of uh, truths in it and uh, some um, the same observations, but I thought it, it'd be more than worth our time to look at. Um, this, this one, I think, is interesting because it's a very personal story, and when I say that, I mean that it's... Uh, I think it's very personal to the author, it's very personal to the prophet, and I think it speaks uh, very well into who we are often, just as human beings. And one of the things that I, th I thought about that you might need, just as reference points, is kind of a, a backstory of why this story, I think, holds so much weight for this prophet. So if you, when we get into reading Obadiah, what we're going to find is that um, it's, it's sort of a, a, it's set in a way that's a, a very old kind of, I want to say, family rivalry. Um, it really depicts um, a different way of understanding the relationship between um, Israel and kind of its cousin, which are the, the people of Edom. So the Edomites and Israel have a very complicated history, and to understand it a little bit, you have to understand kind of, um, you have to understand that history. So if you looked back uh, all the way to Genesis, you'd see one of our uh, one of our key beginning rivalries with uh, with family between uh, two brothers that you know. And to understand Obadiah, you have to understand the dynamics of this relationship. So if you think about Israel and um, another group like Edom, um, they, these are people who at one point had the same ancestry, and then that ancestry kind of split off. And if you go back to Genesis, you see where this began. If you're looking at the relationship between Jacob and Esau, uh, that's where we start, because as you know, um, there were these two brothers, and Jacob became the, the favored one in terms of the <coughs> um, having the inheritance. Um, he kind of was sneaky and took uh, his brother Esau's inheritance. And Esau is um, the brother that um, is kind of our focal point for a moment, because um, that's where we get the, the term Edomite or someone from Edom uh, because uh, the people of Israel uh, split off as descendants of Jacob and the people of Edom split off eventually as those who were the descendants of Esau. And Esau kind of has uh, two different names. His, his name, um, one he's referred to as someone who is has a lot of uh, hair. He's a hairy guy, uh, and so uh, his some of his name is an homage to that. But the word Edom is also a reference to him, and it's, it's an, sort of another name for Esau. And Edom means red, so he is a. It, it describes his physical characteristics. So uh, when we think of uh, Esau, we think of this kind of red, hairy guy, and he's uh, um, the brother, of course, of Jacob. Um, now, we know that these, these brothers had um, a very tense um, 
number of years. Uh, Jacob takes his inheritance and he runs off. And then, but they eventually, in the later part of Genesis, they come back together and they reconcile. But their, their families still split off. So you have Jacob going one way and Esau going another way. And eventually they become two distinct groups of people, uh, Israel um, and Edom. And if you were to look up in scripture, in whatever way you do, different place where the Edomites are, are mentioned, you'll see throughout scripture that it's a tense relationship, that, that past um, continues to sort of uh, show up over and over again. And so as we look at the book of Obadiah, we have to have that relationship in mind because that helps to define and explain a lot of where we are in this story. Um, so as I said, Obadiah is, um, is a short book. I think it's the shortest one in the Old Testament. It's only 21 verses long. And so we're going to read all 21 of those verses. And along the way, what, what I want to lift up to you is is just the places where we see some of that tension uh, played out. So I'm going to read here this for you. And uh, just if you want to, you can pause and go back and look at the story of Jacob and Esau. That might give you a good frame of reference. And then look at places where there's tension between those two groups of people. Uh, one really good example would be when the, the um, Israel has escaped from Egypt and they're moving across the, the, uh, the desert and they're about to go into the promised land. And Israel asks Edom, can we go through your land? We won't touch anything. We won't do anything. We will uh, keep an appropriate social distance, so to speak. Uh, but we just want to go through your land because that's a, a much easier passage. And Edom says, no, we don't want you anywhere near our land. So go another way. So it's, it's just a centuries-old kind of rivalry, and um, it reminds me a lot of the way family systems work, and I, I just think that's an interesting kind of piece of this letter. So the setting for Obadiah is uh, you have to move forward a, a, a long way, even from, uh, from Jacob and Esau, and then to the uh, Israel going across the desert to the Promised Land, and when they have this encounter with Edom, and then several hundred years later, you know, we go from the Israel getting into the land, um, setting up residence, um, having a united kingdom, having that kingdom split apart, and the, the north and the south uh, living separately, the north being taken into exile, and then the south having the same thing done. And the, the setting for this is Obadiah um, having kind of a beef, I guess you could say, with the people of Edom, saying, you didn't help us when this exile happened. Uh, the invaders came in, and you were sort of there in your, in your high, um, high mountainous land, and you didn't help, and in fact, you in, in many ways hurt us. And that sticks with us. And we want you to know that God was watching, and that kind of feeling, um, I think, resonates with people because we know that relationships, especially within families, can be really hard. And so this, uh, this betrayal that Obadiah feels that Edom has perpetrated is a personal one. It's not just because the, the two peoples are relatively close to each other geographically, but they have a family history. Uh, you can almost think of them as, as, as sibling or cousin nations. Uh, and so this, is, th this really, uh, I think, strikes at the heart of Obadiah, and you can see a lot of pain in the way that he describes how all of this happened. So let me, <clears throat> let me just read this for you. I may pause along the way, but um, I want to give you just a sense of what Obadiah says. So we're going to read this whole book. Here we go. Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a report from the Lord, and a messenger has been sent among the nations. Rise up, let us rise against it for battle. I will surely make you least among the nations, 
you shall be utterly despised. Your proud heart has deceived you, you that live in the clefts of the rock, whose dwelling is in the heights. You say in your heart, Who will bring me down to the ground? Though you soar aloft like the eagle, though you nest is set among the stars, from there I will bring you down, says the Lord. So he's, of course, speaking directly to them, where they live, their vantage point from, uh, from that place, and that they will not be there forever. So starting again in verse 5. If thieves came to you, if plunderers by night, how you had been destroyed. Would they not steal only what they wanted? If grape gatherers came to you, would they not leave gleanings? How Esau has been pillaged, his treasures searched out. All your allies have deceived you. They have driven you to the border. Your confederates have prevailed against you, those who ate your bread and have set a trap for you. There is no understanding of it. On that day, says the Lord, I will destroy the wise of Edom and understanding out of Mount Esau. Your warriors shall be shattered, O Tenem, so that everyone from Mount Esau will be cut off. And Tenem is just a region within the land of the Edomites. So uh, the subtitle here, as we start verse 10, says, Edom mistreated his brother. <clears throat> For the slaughter and violence done to your brother Jacob, shall, shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aside, on the day the strangers carried off his wealth, and foreigners entered, entered his gates, and cast lots for Jerusalem. You too were like one of them. Basically meaning, you're responsible for the fact that this happened to us. These strangers, Babylon came and destroyed us, and you just sat by idly. And because you sat by, that means that you are also guilty. Um, verse 12. But you should not have gloated over your brother on the day of his misfortune. You should not have rejoiced over the people of Judah on the day of their ruin. You should not have boasted on the day of distress. You should not have entered the gate of my people on the day of their calamity. You should not have joined in the gloating over Judah's disaster on the day of his calamity. You should not have looted his goods on the day of his calamity. You should not have stood at the crossings to cut off uh, his fugitives. You should not have handed over his survivors on the day of his distress. For the day of the Lord is near against all the nations, as you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head, for as you have drunk on our holy mountain, all the nations around you shall drink. They shall drink and gulp down, and they shall be as though it has never been. So again, basically saying, you're responsible, you gloated, you in some ways rubbed it in our faces, and this will come back to you. So this is clearly written out of a, a great deal of pain and misfortune and, um, and anger. So this is uh, just ending up the book in verse 17. But on Mount Zion there shall be those that escape, and it shall be holy. And the house of Jacob shall take possession of those who dispossess them. The house of Jacob shall be a fire, the house of Joseph a flame and the house of Esau, stubble, that they shall burn them and consume them, and there shall be no survivor of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. Those of the Negeb shall possess Mount Esau, and those of the Shephelah shall um, the land of the Philistines, they shall possess the land of Ephraim and the land of Samaria, and Benjamin shall possess Gilead. So meaning all your neighbors are just going to take over you like we were taken over. The exiles of Israel who are in Hala shall possess Phoenicia as far as Zarephath. And the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Shepharad shall possess the towns of Negeb. Those who have been saved shall go up to Mount Zion to rule Mount Esau. And the kingdom shall be the Lord's. So, not a lot of hope, not a lot of uh, grace, not a lot of any of those feelings. Um, what I like about Obadiah is that um, 
it feels to me a lot like a, the the Psalms. If you think about David, if you want to look at some some passages from the Psalms that David writes, um, David has a, a a very keen sense of being able to express uh, his own anger, his own rage, his own um, discomfort, and um, doesn't hide the fact that he wants other people to suffer too. I am certainly not a proponent of wishing that on anybody. Um, if people do us wrong, certainly we, we, want, um, we want grace. Um, we can understand, though, the, the sense of a need for accountability and a sense to uh, point to where people have failed them, um, that they only, pers- they only um, in their action or inaction, um, enabled others to do harm. And I think that's a big part of this, that it's, it's sort of a, a call for us to, to hold up a mirror to others, or maybe even to ourselves, when we either act wrongly or we don't act and just allow bad things to happen. And I think that that message um, speaks to me a lot in, in a couple of different ways. You and I, when we think about our society in any time or place, um, are responsible. We're responsible for the ways that we perpetrate bad things happening to others, whether consciously or not. And when we stand by and allow injustice to happen, we are also responsible. And that, I think, will preach forever, um, regardless of what's happening around you. But I think that's an important message for, for Christians and for any people of faith when they consider who they're supposed to be, what they're supposed to be up to, that we're supposed to be those who are um, willing to raise our hands and, and stop the things that we are doing that only um, help to support violence against others. But we are also those who, if we simply just stand by and say nothing and do nothing, then we have a responsibility too. And I think that's important. And then I think the other lesson for all of us, which I think is timeless, is just the ways that we struggle in families. And there might be times when you feel um, like Jacob or like Israel, that you have been those who um, have been dealt a hand that is unfair and that is harsh, and you are looking for answers and you're angry. But you also may be in the position of Esau or the people of Edom who are the ones who need to say you're sorry, are the ones who need to uh, do something to reconcile. Uh, Because certainly the people of Israel have have needed to, to be the same because they saw that in the relationship between Jacob and Esau. Jacob wronged his brother Esau and had to reconcile with him. And Esau had to forgive. Um, And they did. um, But that kind of tension doesn't go away with one simple encounter. And so my encouragement to you, I'm hoping as we read this book, is twofold. One, that we think about how we consciously or unconsciously are responsible for the world around us, how inaction can be just as harmful as action, and where our responsibilities lie when it comes to our own families. Sometimes you need to be the the person who expresses your hurts because you haven't. And sometimes you need to be the, the people who can listen, the person who can listen, and who can somehow find a way to say that you're sorry to find reconciliation. And so I encourage you to not only think about those things in your own life and in the society we live in, but to, to look back into scripture uh, at this relationship, which I think is fascinating, and see how that tension is perpetuated over and over again. I like the opportunity in, in these moments to, to think about prophets as speaking to us personally, because reading these more minor and obscure prophets sometimes feels 
there's a kind of a disconnect for us, which is why we don't read them as often. Um, the, the stories aren't ones that maybe we're familiar with. The backgrounds um, or the places that are mentioned aren't always things that we know. But when we pause and we do a little bit of reading and, and some research and, and think about um, the scene, then I think the, the personal and what applies to us can come out um, relatively quickly. So I hope that this gives you a, a, a little sense of what, um, what this book is about. Um, try, hopefully you can read it again and see what other little things pop out to you. But I'm hoping that um, um, the way that I've presented this today um, hits home a little bit for you. So let's pray and then uh, we'll, be, we'll be done for our, our lesson today. God, we thank you for opening up your scriptures to us. And in these books that we don't read very often, we know that your truth of love and grace and compassion um, is real and is just as real and as uh, full and rich here as they are in anywhere else in the Bible. And that we hope that we can learn lessons, that we are careful with our actions, but just as careful when we decide not to act. And that regardless of whether we identify more with Jacob or with Esau, with Israel or with Edom, that you would compel us to be those who uh, seek love and seek compassion and reconciliation. Keep us towards that goal. We pray that in a, a time that we know that, that our, our nation and our neighborhoods are in strife, that you would allow us to find ways of supporting and loving each other, that we would keep um, looking for ways to reach out instead of looking for excuses not to. We thank you for all the ways that you compel us and love us. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, thanks again, everyone, for joining us, and we'll see you next week. Take care.